Most boat owners think staying afloat is simple. The boat floats. End of story. But the truth, buoyancy, is sneakier than that. One wrong load shift, one bad hull curve, and your boat can lose lift faster than your wallet on a fuel dock. Let me show you what exactly it means for you and your boat. Let's start with the obvious. Yes, buoyancy keeps your boat from sinking. But what most people don't realize is that buoyancy changes constantly as your boat moves, planes, turns, or even takes on passengers. Buoyancy isn't a fixed number. It's a dynamic balance between gravity pulling you down and water pushing you up. That upward force known as the buoyant force equals the weight of the water your hull displaces. It sounds simple, right? But here's where it gets fun. The shape of your hull, the weight distribution inside it, and even how fast you're moving all play massive roles in how that buoyant force behaves. Ever wondered why a pontoon boat rides level no matter how many people pile on board, while a deep V fishing boat squats like it's exhausted after lunch? That's not luck. It's buoyancy physics. If this already taught you something new, hit subscribe and tap the bell. We're just getting started. Every boater owes their life to one guy, Archimedes of Syracuse. Over 2,000 years ago, he discovered that the upward force on an object submerged in fluid equals the weight of the fluid it displaces. He supposedly shouted, Eureka! in the bath. But we'll forgive the dramatics, because he basically invented boating math. If your boat weighs 3,000 pounds, it must push aside 3,000 pounds of water to float. That's the golden rule. But here's the twist. Water doesn't care how you reach that number. Whether you're a sleek fiberglass hull or a rusting barge, the math stays the same. The difference lies in how efficiently you displace that water. A flat-bottom boat spreads its displacement across a wide area, creating a lot of lift in shallow water. A narrow hull displaces deeper but less surface area, great for slicing through waves, but less stable at rest. So, Archimedes gave us the rule, but it's your hull that writes the story. Now here's where things get interesting. Your boat doesn't just float, it balances. Every floating object has two key points. The center of gravity, CG, where your boat's mass is concentrated. The center of buoyancy, CB, the geometric center of the displaced water beneath you. Your boat stays upright only when these two points line up vertically. If your CG shifts, say, everyone runs to one side to see dolphins, the CB tries to move with it to restore balance. That's why your boat rocks but doesn't flip instantly. However, if your CG rises too high, from poor loading, top-heavy design, or big upper decks, the boat's riding moment, its ability to resist rolling, gets weaker. That's when capsizes happen. Think of it like balancing a broom on your hand. Keep the weight low, and it's stable. Raise it up, and you're juggling with gravity. Real example? The Costa Concordia disaster in 2012, that cruise ship's huge superstructure gave it a high center of gravity. Once it listed too far, the buoyant force couldn't realign beneath it fast enough. That's buoyancy failing under bad balance. When your boat tilts, the center of buoyancy shifts sideways, creating a lever arm between it and the center of gravity. That lever, called the riding arm, generates torque that pushes the boat upright again. The longer that riding arm, the more stable your boat feels. That's why wide-beam boats like catamarans or pontoon platforms feel rock-solid. They have huge riding moments. Narrow boats, like canoes or racing shells, have tiny ones. Hence why they roll over if you sneeze too hard. But here's the catch. Too much stability can make a ride uncomfortable. A boat that rights itself too quickly feels stiff and snappy, jerking side to side in chop. That's why designers carefully tune hull width, de-ed rise, and ballast to find that sweet spot between comfort and confidence. So next time someone brags their boat never rocks, remind them 
Comfort lies somewhere between a barge and a bathtub. Here's something most owners never think about. Your boat's buoyancy changes once it starts moving. Static buoyancy is what keeps you afloat at rest. Dynamic buoyancy is what happens when water flow under your hull adds lift, the same principle airplanes use. When your hull moves forward, it generates pressure differences between the bow and stern. The faster you go, the more water is forced downward, pushing the hull upward. That's dynamic lift, the magic behind planing. At slow speeds, you're in displacement mode, all buoyancy. At high speeds, you're in planing mode, a mix of buoyancy and hydrodynamic lift. The transition point is where fuel bills double, your passengers grab the rails, and your hull screams, Physics! Engage! Here's the trick. That shift isn't just speed-based. It depends on hull design. Flat and stepped hulls plane early. Deep V hulls need more speed to overcome drag. Catamarans? They use dynamic lift from both hulls, small surface, big reward. So the next time your boat struggles to plane, don't blame the engine. You're not fighting power, you're negotiating with buoyancy. Ever notice how your boat rides higher in the ocean than in fresh water? That's not imagination, it's density. Salt water is heavier, about 2.5% denser than fresh water. That means for every cubic foot displaced, you get more upward force. Same boat, same weight, but more lift. It's like suddenly discovering your boat's been on a diet. That's why ships bound for the open sea load differently, depending on where they're going. Their plimsoll line, that painted mark on the hull, literally tells captains how deep they can safely sit in water based on density. S for salt water, F for fresh water. Here's a fun real world example. A 5,000 pound boat that draws 18 inches in fresh water will float about an inch higher in salt water. Doesn't sound like much, but it's enough to change trim, prop angle, and performance. So if you trailer your boat between lakes and coastal waters, expect handling changes. Buoyancy physics never stops adjusting, even when you do. Let's talk about one of the easiest ways to mess with buoyancy, bad weight placement. Your hull was designed to displace water evenly. Add too much weight forward and the bow digs in, reducing lift and increasing drag. Add too much aft and your transom squats, your prop aerates, and your steering feels like wrestling a shopping cart. Here's where buoyancy fights back. It tries to lift where the weight presses down, but it can only do so much before resistance increases exponentially. That's why your boat feels sluggish when overloaded aft or lists to one side when the cooler's in the wrong place. Real example. A 22-foot center console with dual batteries, live well, and two passengers aft can shift its center of gravity by over 8 inches, enough to cost 4 knots at cruise and raise fuel burn by 15%. The fix? Distribute weight evenly along the boat's longitudinal axis. Move heavy items closer to the center. That keeps your center of gravity low and balanced, letting buoyancy do its job without overcompensating. In short, balance isn't just comfort, it's free efficiency. If metacentric height sounds complicated, it's just the fancy name for how stable your boat really is. When your boat heels to one side, the center of buoyancy moves to counteract it. The point where the buoyant force acts vertically upward through the hull is called the metacenter. The vertical distance between your boat's center of gravity and the metacenter is the metacentric height, gm. The larger the gm, the more stable the boat. But here's the kicker. Too much gm makes the boat snap upright too fast, creating that twitchy motion you feel in choppy water. Too little GM, and your boat rolls slowly, sometimes dangerously, like a pendulum. Sailboats often have low centers of gravity, thanks to ballast keels, and large GM values to resist healing. Power boats, especially tall cabin cruisers, must balance their GM carefully to avoid becoming top-heavy. 
Designers literally tune stability using GM calculations before a hull ever touches water. So the next time someone calls naval architecture boring math, remind them, that math is the reason their drink isn't sliding off the table. Here's a buoyancy killer most owners never think about. The free surface effect. It happens when water moves freely inside a partially filled tank or bilge. As the boat rolls, that water sloshes to one side, shifting the internal center of gravity with it. The result? A dangerous feedback loop that reduces stability. Even a few gallons of water in the bilge can have the same destabilizing effect as moving hundreds of pounds side to side. That's why large ships divide their tanks into compartments to stop water from moving freely. In smaller boats, it's why you should always pump your bilge dry and secure your live wells and fuel. That sloshing sound you ignore isn't harmless. It's physics plotting against you. Real story. The 1987 Herald of Free Enterprise Ferry disaster in England was caused by water rushing onto the car deck. The sudden free surface effect caused a catastrophic loss of stability, all from water moving inside the ship. So remember, water belongs outside your hull, not inside it. Trim isn't just about looks, it's pure hydrodynamics in motion. As your boat accelerates, the center of buoyancy shifts aft, lifting the bow. The trick is to find the angle where your hull rides efficiently, usually between 3 and 5 degrees. Too much bow lift, and you increase drag and lose visibility. Too little, and you're plowing water like a tugboat. What's happening underneath? Your boat is constantly renegotiating how much hull area is submerged. As the bow rises, less hull touches water, decreasing buoyant lift but increasing dynamic lift. It's a constant physics tug of war between displacement and hydrodynamics. Trim tabs, jack plates, and weight placement all exist to help you manage this shifting buoyancy balance. Used right, they let you dial in that sweet spot where your hull feels light but planted, where fuel economy peaks and wake size drops. When you nail that balance, you're not just trimming, you're fine-tuning buoyancy in real time. Ever seen a boat capsize but not sink completely? That's not magic, it's reserve buoyancy. Foam cores, sealed compartments, and air pockets all contribute to keeping your hull afloat even when swamped. The principle is simple. As long as the volume of air trapped within the hull weighs less than the water it displaces, it will stay buoyant. That's why modern boats include positive flotation, sealed foam sections under decks or seats that guarantee the boat stays afloat even when flooded. It's Archimedes again, working overtime. For example, the U.S. Coast Guard requires boats under 20 feet to have enough flotation to keep them afloat when swamped. Without it, a flooded fiberglass hull would sink like a rock once filled with water. So, when manufacturers brag about unsinkable design, it's not marketing fluff, it's physics by regulation. Foam isn't there for comfort, it's your emergency life insurance made of air. Here's something most boaters forget. Water density changes with temperature. Cold water is denser than warm water, meaning it provides more buoyant force. That's why your boat might sit slightly higher in a chilly northern lake than it does in a tropical bay. The effect is small, maybe half an inch, but on larger vessels it matters. Cold water gives more lift, but it's also thicker, increasing drag. Warm water is smoother but less supportive. The difference even affects fuel economy and performance. Outboard engines in colder climates push against thicker, heavier water, which increases load. You might notice your RPMS drop slightly at the same throttle setting compared to summer runs. In short, the water's mood changes with the seasons, and buoyancy changes with it. Let's be clear. Nothing is truly unsinkable. Even boats packed with foam can lose stability, capsize, or flood. What designers mean is, will remain afloat. 
Remember that unsinkable Boston Whaler ad from the 1960s where they cut the boat in half and it still floated? It worked because both halves had enough foam to displace more water than they weighed. But it didn't mean you could sail away happily, it just meant you wouldn't vanish beneath the surface. So while positive buoyancy is an incredible safety feature, it's no substitute for balance, proper loading, and maintenance. Foam saves you when things go wrong, but physics rewards those who prevent it from getting that far. Let's stretch buoyancy to its limits for a moment. Submarines and hydrofoils live on opposite ends of the buoyancy spectrum. Submarines control buoyancy by filling or emptying ballast tanks. Fill them with water and they sink, empty them, and they rise. It's precise manipulation of Archimedes' principle, nothing more. Hydrofoils do the opposite. They minimize buoyancy. As speed increases, lift from the underwater wings raises the hull completely out of the water, reducing drag by up to 80%. It's the holy grail of efficiency, trading static buoyancy for dynamic lift. Both examples prove the same truth. Mastering buoyancy means mastering control. Whether you're pushing under or lifting above, it's all about balance between weight, displacement, and flow. Buoyancy isn't just the reason your boat floats. It's the heartbeat of everything happening beneath you. Every shift, every turn, every wake is physics balancing gravity and water pressure in real time. When you understand buoyancy, you stop guessing why your boat behaves the way it does. You start seeing the invisible rules at play, rules that make the difference between smooth, efficient control and frustrating inefficiency. Your boat already knows these secrets. Now you do too. If this video gave you that aha moment, hit subscribe, tap the bell, and drop a comment with your boat type and where you sail. I read every single one. Until next time, keep your trim steady, your balance centered, and your physics on your side.